Uh, I was struck uh, listening to uh, the presentations that uh, I went back to thinking about what we said when this crisis began, which was there was going to be a great crisis of capitalism, that uh, economic views would change, that political views would change, and that the market system uh, would come under uh, considerable questioning and possibly cons considerable uh, stress, uh, and that we'd see more populism and things uh, like that. If I could ask any of you if you think that's what we're beginning to see, these things take a long time to happen. Rodrigo mentioned uh, social stresses, Ronnie mentioned uh, social uh, stresses. Uh, do you think we're going through a period at which Marx, as uh, I read the other day, the end of the neoliberal period of uh, consensus which began in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and uh, has it reached an end? And are we going back to a system uh, in which there's more government intervention, uh, less reliance on markets, and less acceptance of the outcome of uh, market processes? Uh, I think we'll go in uh, order of the speakers. Uh, Larry, if you're willing to fire away on that, and you can be also be country specific if you prefer. It's too early to know. Um, Ronnie spoke about Asia. The Asian financial crisis in 1997 was declared to mark a total change in the way everybody was going to think about Asia. In retrospect, it was a very significant event for Thailand, for Indonesia, for uh, Korea, for Asia broadly. But I don't think it marked, with 15 years hindsight, a broad and fundamental historical discontinuity. And there is always a tendency to declare new eras. There was the new era of Russian supremacy after Sputnik. There was the era of permanent scarcity in the 1970s. There was an era of Japan as number one, as the Nikkei rose during the 1980s. And so I think it is a serious mistake to conflate hugely important events with permanently transformational events and assuming successful management going forward, I rather doubt that this will be remembered as a definitive event in the history of capitalism. If this moment is a definitive moment in the history of capitalism, I think it is much more likely to have to do with things that are even more fundamental than finance. Changes in technology and phenomena associated with globalization that are leading to very substantial increases in the earning capacity of a small fraction of the population and challenging the employment prospects for a substantial majority. And I think those issues, uh, how an economy will function in a world where a machine can handle your bill as you leave a store, drive a car, manufacture anything that can be described and grade an essay exam and what that means both in terms of the potential for betterment and productivity and prosperity but also in terms of the prospects for mass employment if this is a moment around transforming capitalism I think it's more likely to have to do with that than it is to do with the financial bubble, poorly supervised banks, and all of that. That, that will be a smaller revolution in human affairs. Thanks, uh, thanks Larry. Uh, if anybody else uh, wants to add a brief comment to that, uh, Ronnie? It is truly amazing that for a moment, considering 
Israel as part of the West, which you all do, but the reality is we in Asia consider you as the Western end of Asia. Don't forget that. Uh, it is interesting that the West should be asking that question, that perhaps we are, are we moving away from the market? Uh, the reality is Asia is moving into the market. We are, in fact, gradually becoming the defender of the market. For example, when China entered the WTO, uh, that was China's, uh, 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 I, should say, I should say baptism, bar mitzvah into, uh, uh, into the global market economy. 20 years later, the rest are asking that question, whereas the, we in the East say, wow, we pay a hefty price to get in, and now that we're in, we found that it's a pretty good place. And so now they are perhaps even more market driven than you are because it's to their own benefit. So uh, it's thank God that the whole world is now moving in, toward the market. I think that Larry is correct. I don't think that you know, the, the, the West is any time going uh, anywhere in this regard. So let's make sure they will work together to perfect the market economy, the system that takes a lot of rebalancing. And we will be helping you. The system was set up for 1945 thereafter by the West. Asian basically have no voice in it. Now that Asia is rising, Japan and then now China and India and so forth, we need to have a voice in that as well. And you need to give room to the Asians so that we can become more or less equal partners, but let's face it, you're the big brother. R Ronnie, if I, if I can just add a, a comment on that, uh, something which, which has bothered me uh, for some time. Uh, you'll certainly have a voice, the, but what happened in 1945 was that a new global system was set up based on a set of ideas which more or less worked for a very long time and probably are still working, as you say, in important respects. What are the different Asian ideas that uh, are going to be reflected by the increased weight of Asia in the running of the global economy? Well, actually, uh, in 1945 or thereafter, uh, the Chinese uh, listened to the wrong guy in Europe. <laughs> they turned communistic. And history shows that that is a big, huge mistake. And then now we are finally waking up and joining you guys, so it's good days. Rodrigo? I, I agree with Larry that this is, I mean, it's too early to say. In the case of Latin America, I see some movement in that direction, in the direction of more state and less market. Uh, but it's not related to the financial crisis, since the region was not hit, at least very significantly, with the financial crisis. It has to do more with this rising middle class that I was mentioning, which is, of course, a good news, but uh, there are social movements demanding uh, more access to different benefits. Um, uh, in the past, the answer to these uh, episodes in Latin America was populism and economic stagnation at the end. Uh, so I guess that this time we need to be up to the challenge and to avoid populism. Thanks, Martin. I can't resist pointing out to my very good friend Ronnie that Asia was a European idea. Uh, Communism. I assure you, Communism I assure you that idea. ancient China did not consider this part of the world part of any form of civilization. Um, however, the more important point to make is, uh, I make two points. First, I think it's clear you can't beat something with nothing. So, since the fall of communism, no credible alternative ideology for running a complex economic system has come forward, so we will end up with the market. That's number one. Number two, as is obvious if you look around the world, there are many different ways of running, managing, interfering with, regulating market systems. And I think the view that there is one hegemonic way, viz, the US way, let's be quite clear, that's taken a pretty big bashing in the last few years, and it will take quite a while to come back. So I think the details of how economies are run, how banks and financial systems are regulated, uh, how the relationship between companies, shareholders, and other stake stakeholders work, those are all up for grabs. And interestingly, 
and I think very rightly so. So we will remain within the broad family of market economic systems, but there are many versions, and I hope we will all be doing many experiments over the next few years, and we will realize there is no ca canonical model of this system. Thanks. Sorry, Larry. You know, at some level, Martin must be, Mar Martin's right. And Martin's right about the importance of experiments. And certainly there's a lot that's happened in the United States, particularly in the financial system, that obviously calls forth a uh, change and that hadn't fully been recognized or anticipated before it happened. On the other hand, there really are two different economic tasks. There's a task of pushing forward from the frontier, which is the basic economic task of the United States or of Europe or of Japan. And there's a task of convergence to the frontier, which is the task of much of the rest of the world. And while I respect Martin's criticisms of the American model, I would also respectfully suggest that neither the European model nor the Japanese model of economic advance from the frontier has stood up extraordinarily well over the last uh, decade. And I would put one other issue on the table, which is the tendency for some economic doctrines in a certain sense to become victims of their success. Think about what has happened to agriculture in most of the world. What has happened to agriculture in most of the world is that basically the combination of science and the market has led to staggering increases in productivity, as a consequence of which the food that is needed can now be produced by only a tiny minority of the society. And so agricultural economics, which was once the central field of economics, is now very much a subsidiary field of economics. The relative price in the United States, hear this, the relative price in the United States of a television set and a year in a university, according to our consumer price indices, has changed by a factor of 100 since 1983 because of the spectacular increases in productivity and manufacturing and because of all the challenges in education and healthcare. And so a much larger fraction of our economies going forward are going to be those areas that are more complex than the ones where simple markets work. And the more markets succeed, the more that's going to be true. And the larger the fraction of people who are going to be engaged in sectors like healthcare and education, where simple capitalist logic is less compelling. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Larry. I'm getting the uh, hook from, uh, from one of the organizers here, but I, I think we have time for one uh, question. Uh, who's, uh, who's calling for that? Uh, yep, go ahead. Uh, can somebody get uh, get uh, get to get him a mic? No, we can't hear Thank you. Thank you. There we go. First, Ronnie, I think Vancouver has um, accepted and addressed the Asian influence in a very different way than a lot of places in the world, positively. Martin Wolf, I wonder when you are talking about the growth in the European sector of one percent or maybe even under that, and very slow growth, how you put a lid on the unrest of the unemployment of the youth, the 54% in Spain, the more than 50% in Greece, the fact that the younger part of the uh, nations out the, uh, or in Europe are growing at such a great extent. How do you put a lid on that with that kind of growth and not have social unrest, riots in the street like we've seen? Where, where's the, 
Where's the answer to that? Whereabouts would the answer to that be? Thank you, Martin. Well, I mentioned in my remarks, I think, that politics was one of the big risks. Um, well, first of all, anybody who I was asked to describe what I think would happen to the Eurozone. Do I think the policies of the Eurozone are good policies? Of course I don't. I'm probably one of its best known critics. So clearly I'm not supporting what has happened. But the question you ask is a positive one, not a normative one, which is what will happen. And I just make two comments. First, the 50% youth unemployment rate is itself colossally bad. But it's important to remember, colossally bad, but it's important to remember that youth unemployment is a rather strange number because such a high proportion of the young people, these are people up to the age of 25, are actually in education. So it's actually quite a small proportion of the cohort uh, that is actually affected by these, because it includes the people who are looking for work. A vast proportion of young people in all our societies are not looking for work. So the, it isn't the case that 50% of young people are unemployed. The case is that most of them are in education, but those looking for work are 50% unemployed, and those are, of course, predominantly the less skilled element of the young and population. I think it's very important to understand that. This doesn't make it good, but it just puts it in context. The second question you raise is, is this politically sustainable? And the answer to that, quite honestly, is I don't know. But the remarkable thing to my mind is how little protest there has been, which has no doubt given policymakers great comfort in this context. And for this, there are a number of important reasons. First, the states affected are welfare states, and they do provide some measure of support. Secondly, and more important, particularly in the southern Europe, family structures are extremely strong and potent, and they take responsibility for looking after the vast majority of young people who are unemployed, and they are enveloped within strong social structures. And third, remember these are very old societies, there aren't that many young people. It may be a very high proportion of the young who are affected, but there just aren't that many young people. So what terrifies me is not that it will explode, but that it won't. And that what will actually happen is they will get away with the policies which, in my view, will amount to the slow, lingering death of a number of economies over the next 10 years. I hope that I am wrong. I really hope that I am wrong. But my concern is actually almost in the opposite direction. When I'm pessimistic, I'm, I fear that there are some parts of the European economy which will go the way of some of the dying regions of our countries. Uh, we. Uh... I've seen lots of hands going up in the audience, but unfortunately, uh, we can't uh, take uh, questions now. I'd just like to add a few uh, concluding words. Uh, the, uh, what we've had is the Asian optimism, which uh, the data certainly bear out. Ronnie talked about uh, China. He could have talked about Indonesia. Uh, he could have talked about much of mainland uh, uh, China. India is not doing quite as well as we had hoped, at least I had hoped uh, it would be doing at this uh, stage, and that seems to be a fairly uh, tough political uh, issue. But if you want to generalize, uh, Asia looks like it's doing well despite uh, the crisis, and uh, we heard both Ronnie and Steve Schwartzman talk about the role the incredibly, incredible role of China and, and the increasing importance of China in the global economy. Uh, if we move, move on to the United States, uh, Larry gave a very upbeat uh, description of that situation. Uh, it's one I share. I think an increasing number of people are sharing that, uh, that view uh, of uh, the United States, but without the eloquence uh, with which Larry described the reasons uh, for that uh, more optimistic uh, view. And Steve Schwartzman gave a more detailed 
uh, nitty-gritty description of where he saw the sources of growth in the U.S. We got a mixed message on Latin America from Rodrigo, but it was far more positive than any message set of messages about Latin America that we might have heard in any of the uh, past decades. Uh, and Latin America is becoming a very different uh, continent as a result of actually its adherence to fairly neoclassical economics, to fairly uh, disciplined macroeconomics in, uh, in many countries, starting in uh, Chile but spreading to uh, others. But there is Venezuela, there is uh, Argentina, so it's not uniform. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, we did talk about Europe. Uh, we've had another discussion on Europe. Uh, I'm, uh, nobody mentioned the fact that, despite everybody's view that there is no adjustment taking place in Europe, relative costs of production in the uh, countries in deep trouble are actually declining and those in Germany are rising. Uh, so some form of adjustment is taking place despite the fixed uh, exchange rates. And finally, we didn't talk about Africa. Africa, like, uh, like uh, Latin America, is a mixed picture, but a far better picture than we've seen about Africa uh, for many decades since the uh, founding decades of African independence in the uh, early uh, 60s. Uh, what's been happening, quite a few countries assisted by Chinese investment uh, and uh, China's desire for raw, raw materials and for energy are uh, improvements and sustained growth in uh, several important African countries, not all of them by any means. So I think if one looks around with the exception of Europe, this feels like a much better global economy uh, than it felt like a year ago. I'm sorry, Martin, that one year of you makes an impression on me equal to three years of everybody else. Uh, but that just describes the power of what you say. Uh, with that, let me uh, conclude by thanking, uh, thanking everybody who's taken part. Thank you. <laughs> thanking President Perez uh, for attending uh, uh, this session and for the uh, remarkable example he has set uh, to many around the world and especially uh, in Israel. I uh, first met President Perez in 1985 when he was the Prime Minister who implemented the stabilization plan that produced over the next uh, 30 years the great improvement that we've seen in the Israeli economy. And in addition to actually being able to do that hard work, he has been a source of visionary inspiration to many over many years. And I have appreciated personally, enormously, his support, and if I may say so, his friendship uh, over the years since uh, we first met. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for being here.